So, welcome, friends, uh, to Sustainable Development E Talks, uh, co hosted by Indian Institute of Management Indore and uh, CNS. And uh, uh, to, as you know, the SDG talk series was launched on World Health Day and will go on till uh, World Environment Day. We will we have 27 thought leaders uh, who will share on sustainable development related issues and help us go uh, dive deeper and uh, to develop deep in our own understanding and analysis. And uh, um, so today we are featuring and we will interact with, we'll listen to insights from Kate Lappin, uh, who she is the regional secretary of, for public services international in, for the region of Asia Pacific and uh, has been a former regional coordinator of APWLD, Asia Pacific Forum on Women Law and Development, and has been a, a personal influence the way how we understand gender and in connection with broader development justice, how we want our lives, how we want our planet, how we want the lives of our own loved ones connected to the planet. So thank you so much, uh, Kate. And I have to say before I, uh, let, uh, before I move away from between you people and Kate Lappin is that uh, Kate's, uh, uh, Kate will be talking about development justice and development justice when we heard it for many years ago from Kate in one of the uh, meetings. The, that was a very influencing moment because it made so much sense and it was such an easy thing to uh, to understand and also communicate that this is what we do and this is where we are focused on. And Kate, you will be, probably you might be knowing that we took it in our mission, that this is oh. the easiest way to uh, communicate that whatever we do is connected to development justice. So thanks a lot <laughs> for your time. So over to you, Kate, thank you. Great. Oh, thanks, Bobby. So nice to hear that, um, you know, that some of that work has had such an important influence to, to shape, you know, the, the important work that you're doing. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about development justice, but just to say that really it came about from a long process of consulting with all civil society groups who were engaged in sustainable development across the Asia and Pacific regions prior to the adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals, but with all, many, many different groups, constituencies, particularly of grassroots um, groups who wanted to change the way that development was happening in the region. Um, and so lots of different groups um, were involved in shaping it, not just uh, you know, not just the feminist groups or not just um, the organisation I was with. So, yeah, there's no single credit for development justice. It's a collective idea to shape um, collective, uh, collective justice and, and a better future. Um, so I've put together some notes to talk to you today. They're a bit sort of just designed to prompt me and I might not use all the slides and it really is just to try and keep me on track to you know, make sure I cover a few different things. But I'm also very keen to just have time to talk and, and to get different inputs um, and questions um, and to follow up on anything that I touch on that's, that's not clear or, or that sounds interesting to people. Um, and obviously now I'll, I'm, I'm working for the Global Union Federation that represents workers who deliver public services. And that the largest of those in terms of our, move, our representation is in the health sector. So I've got a bit of a focus on what the current, the current uh, global economic system and rules means for our health system. And then how can development justice or other alternative models um, deliver something different that would act enable us to respond to the kind of pandemic we're seeing now, um, as well as basically build a, a more just future. Um, and PSI, as a representative of uh, 30 million workers across the world, is also very, is that in addition to representing the rights of those workers, is committed to trying to increase our public services for all, the, the right to have public services. And that means campaigning against those barriers to public services that I'm going to cover. 
Um, so, first of all, we're living in a moment that probably will define uh, our future beyond any way that we have conceived so far. We know that that um, every other pandemic and also major change that we've had, whether it be from conflict or, or whether it be from health or other moments like this where the whole world has participated in a sudden change, changes our societies forever. And this one will be no different. But uh, the question is, what will it change us to? What do we want it to be? And who will decide what it is going to be? And I think it was Winston Churchill that said, never waste a good crisis. And um, we, have, we have many economists who also deliberately think through how to create crises in order to bring about the changes that they need. And sometimes that's, um, that's Naomi Klein's called it disaster capitalism, how do disasters allow for more profit taking um, and more exploitation. And so it, it's really important, I think, that we, we recognise that we're going to, we're in a moment where we can shape the future like perhaps has never has not been done in you know the last 70 years and but others will also shape that future um, pandemics as i mentioned have been part of changing the entire way societies work but they have also reflected the societies they live in so when we know a number of historians that study the history of medicines and the history of health have looked at how pandemics have both uh, have both been spread by the the structure of society that we have, and the way that they the responses reflect the society that um, that will will be shaped. And so examples here, of course, the bubonic plague. Um, but half the population, half the population of Europe at that time died as a cause of um, bubonic plague. And it shaped the, the future in ways that perhaps were unimaginable beforehand. Uh, some indentured labour, for example, was, uh, was abolished in many places, partly because there were just uh, more, far more demand for workers and workers were able to have more bargaining power but it also changed the, what, the role of religious bodies. So um, people questioned a lot more religion and, and, the, and therefore to, uh, people looked for a better option than perhaps what religion was giving them at the time. And, and that meant more democracy. Um, and then the, there's been a bit of talk about the Spanish flu and the, you know, the fact that that also uh, had dramatic global impact in a way that hadn't been felt for many generations. Um, and I think an interesting part of that for particularly for India is the way that the Spanish flu and its impact drove a ind an independence movement, the anti-colonial movement. Um, Gandhi himself having <laughs> contracted it, but then seeing the fact that who get who contracts and who gets services, who gets health, and the fact that the public health system in India was unable to cope with the, the uh, millions of people who contracted the flu and that the responses were incredibly um, unjust, that obviously the wealthy and particularly the British were getting... Um, medical attention where the last large majority and particularly the poorest were dying uh, without public health access. So that shows us, I think, that really we're in a time where we will shape something, but the question is who will be shaping it? In the union movement, I'm not sure if you've heard this phrase, but there's a common phrase that says, touch one, touch all. Meaning, you know, if you, if you sack a worker, everybody should respond, everyone should go on strike. If you try and undermine one worker's wages, you're undermining everybody's. 
And I think that's what this pandemic should teach us is that we are all vulnerable if, the, if some are vulnerable. That um, if the reason we're in lockdowns is the idea that if anybody has it, we can all have it. And that I think is a pretty interesting way for us to think about shaping the future that isn't part of a neoliberal ideal. The neoliberal is we're all in for it ourselves. And of course, Margaret Thatcher told us that there's no society and you don't have to look after society if there is none. So instead, we should be thinking about the way that uh, this virus tells us that we have to organize, how can we organize to care for all? How can our societies be structured in a way that we can care for all? Um, whereas the disease eradication has historically has been uh, very much targeted at the poor. So any type of disease outbreak when, it's, when there's been a discussion about disease eradication has been about uh, getting people off the streets, getting pe people who are considered diseased um, being, being a threat. Um, and yeah, not, to, not looking at the broader public health options that we have where we're all, we all experience the same. So what is stopping us from providing care to all at the moment? Um, and this is globally. I mean, the, the way it impacts is different in each country, but globally, we now have some kind of commonality around the way that economies are organized. And we do have a global economy with global rules. Um, so first of all, privatisation, I think, is stopping us from providing care to all, because if we have any system that is based on the capacity to pay and the capacity to make profits, we're clearly going, cannot deliver the same care for everybody. Um, Labour deregulation, where wages are set according to the market, but also the the rules for, for labour are eradicated and basically again set for, for the market, um, means that some people can't afford care, but also can't afford to take time off, can't afford to live um, um, and basically live in hand to mouth. And that is a real risk. Workers go to work when they're, if they don't have sick leave. Um, and that's how we've seen a lot of infections when workers are forced to work without the, the right for, for um, time off or to, to take care. Um, one of the largest threats here is corporate power, the fact that we clearly have rules that are set for giant corporations to grow rather than for the public good. And I'll cover a little bit more of those um, in a moment. And I think, and. Also, we need to acknowledge that pandemics don't impact on people um, in the same way, that patriarchy has been a large uh, barrier to a more just society. And it's most obvious when we need care because care when the state fails, it inevitably falls on the shoulders of women. Um, and right now we've seen, for example, a threefold increase in domestic violence around the world because women are having to, you know, to take the further burden of dealing with the lockdowns. Um, and when, whenever public health fails, it's women that have had to step in, whether it be for sick people or to look after children, um, or because, you know, they don't have access to other public services like water and energy. But health privatisation, all of our public services have been subject through the, the last um, 40 years of austerity and, and neoliberalism have been turned into market commodities. So that whether that be health, water, energy, education, they've all been turned into commodities over this last 40 years. And at the moment, of course, I think health privatisation is perhaps the one area that you know, is most obvious that countries who have public health systems that might be able to cope with a pandemic are going to fare a lot better than those who have de depended on private health, uh, both because private health systems 
are obviously set up to make a profit and that limits uh, their ICU, their intensive care, because that's not the most profitable element of health. Uh, and because they, um, the, a privatised system is clearly not going to be able to um, cater for so many people. They'll need to find a way for coronavirus to, to be extended for, for a profitable business. Um, and any concept that that health is, or that illness is a way to make profit, as this cartoon shows us, uh, is clearly not going to be designed to, to prevent health, ill health. It requires ill health to be profitable. Um, and so, yeah, we can obviously see a lot, a lot of a different focus in when our health systems are privatised, they depend on a lot of, of ill health um, and therefore the research and development that might go into it isn't about eradicating health problems, really. It's about creating new problems, either the ones that we don't know we have, like, you know, beauty or uh, things that really we don't need to spend time or money on, or they are about finding new markets, and that's where health tourism might, for example, come in. Um, and you probably can't see so much um, the this kind of graph here, but just to show you that when a, pri a system is uh, a country privatizes their health, the difference here is between the US, Canada, and the UK, and how much a drug drugs would cost them in those countries that are dependent on a, a private compared to a public. And of course, the US is the most infamous in terms of its um, its health system being privatized. And you can see the large differences in terms of um, the costs for anybody living in the US. And that's what, of course, will happen increasingly when we, if we allow this pandemic to, to be managed by the private sector. And coming to India, of course, it also has a, a large reliance on the private sector for health. And you can see here that the cost is really clear when when it's a cost um, when private when health is dealt with by the private sector. There's an enormous difference, and in terms of um, the public investment, whether that be out of government's hands or whether out of private um, hands, you will have to pay a huge amount more. And that's the same in many countries, partly just from profiteering but also because it's designed to do that. So there's a lot more in health intervention in countries that rely on the private sector. So a, a simple thing like uh, something that you would have every, in every country like um, giving birth will have a lot more interventions in the US than it would in a, a country with public health. Um, and you can see here again that India is a country that's spending far less on its public health and then other countries, even those in similar economic circumstances. Now, when it comes to sustainable development and the sustainable development goals, um, health, of course, is one of those, universal health access is one of those targets, but it doesn't, there are many failures in the sustainable development goals. And, you know, and one of those is that it does still open up for the private sector and talks about things like public-private partnerships and hasn't clearly said that universal health must be in public hands and free, free. of course, it talks about affordable, but, um, but it does sort of talk also include the health workforce. And for that, you can see from these stats that, um, that there's the target, which is a target for 45 health professionals per 10,000 is, you know, that India is, is both well off, but also not increasing, whereas a lot of countries have increased over time their health workforce. It hasn't been a large increase, particularly in public investment in um, the health workforce. So there would need to be, and this is, this is the sustainable development goals don't set a standard that would, you know, get you to a, a developed country health workforce. Um, there's other statistics for that, but this is just for the minimum, really for the minimum for, for developing countries. So 
Well, these threats then that we see, where particularly in countries that have embraced privatised health, uh, mean that that we will, you know, we will have face an increasing pressure from those corporations to privatise the vaccine that you know that is expected. You can see here that um, the large amounts of profits on the on the um, the graph on the right from some of those drug companies, but also the drug companies are constantly saying that they need they need to charge this amount because they have to do a you know huge amount of research and development. First of all, especially for this uh, vaccine, most of that research will be in the public. The public will continue to fund it through university research. What the public has, what the what the um, governments have mainly given up is the capacity to produce the pharmaceuticals and the vaccines um, and put that, they've privatised that arm of public health in many countries, um, the, even those that have public health systems. But the, the graph on the left shows that that argument, you know, even taking profits out of it, out of the equation, the, the research and development that pharmaceutical companies do is very small comparatively, um, even to marketing. So you can see that the blue, the blue um, circles are research and development and that orange is marketing, let alone the other costs that they have and, and the profit taking. Um, so I mentioned earlier that we need to prepare ourselves for responses before I hopefully go on to development justice, but we need to be aware that there is going to be a change and that there's going to be contest over what that change will be because we're going into a, an entirely different future, but that others are already shaping that. And of course, one way, one, one of the institutions that will be shaping that is the World Bank, both because they have the funds to be able to shape it and because they have the um, influence over governments. And they continue to promote a neoliberal response to this pandemic. And so you can see that um, the World Bank has talked about actually decreasing regulations um, as a, in order to respond to the pandemic. So this is just a recent quote from uh, the director of the World Bank, uh, suggesting that countries will need to implement structural reforms and structural reforms which have been promoted by the World Bank for years are those I mentioned earlier, are privatisation, uh, uh, liberalisation, deregulation of both labour and of corporation rules that um, regulate corporations, um, and of foreign investment, so allowing foreign investors into countries without limitation. Um, so they're, they're ready to continue to provide the orthodox advice they have, and at the same time, they're providing some funds, either through loans or grants, and um, and they have. And in India, in particular, they've they've identified one billion dollars to go into health. But if the the quote here we have on the left are suggesting that 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 investment will will need to go into the private sector purely because of the existing problems with the public health system. And if this happens, it's clearly going to reinforce. Um, the dependence on the private sector, as well as reinforce those rules that uh, the World Bank is a key proponent of. So let's get then a little bit to what we could do as an alternative. Um, and one of the interesting things I think that this that's happening right now is that there are a lot of different groups around the world calling for a fundamental shift in the way that the global, the global economy works. And some of those have called it a Green New Deal. You can see that down the bottom there. That's um, you know, a senator from the US who's launched this idea for a Green New Deal. There's also been, I think, um, the, the, the concept of a new social contract and pretty similar or a just transition. Sometimes it's called a just transition to a new, to a sustainable economy. Um, 
and a similar idea, I think uh, obviously a little bit more weighted towards recognising how economies discriminate against women is the feminist fossil fuel free future, the tongue twister, um, and development justice, um, which is, as I mentioned earlier, the model that was created in the Asia Pacific region. So I think there's huge amounts of similarities and really um, potential for the, these, these ideas all to influence each other. Development justice, if you see that uh, down the bottom, is I think one of the reasons it's been appealing to a lot of groups is partly because of the simplicity of the five areas that have been identified. And I think all um, groups can see their demands reflected in one in those five areas and at the same time see that those demands can't be advanced without the others, both because you know they're often independent, interdependent, but because no social, no single group can really achieve transformation without the solidarity of others. And so that that uh, those five, those five what are called transformative shifts, uh, start with redistributive justice, and that means recognising the vast inequalities of wealth and resources that currently exist both between countries and within countries. And we are living at a moment where the world is increasingly becoming more unequal and that the last financial crisis was a generated even more inequality. And I think that's partly why there needs to be a real focus now. We're going through another crisis and we know last time and during the global financial crisis, there was always also a sense that we will learn lessons from that. This, we will see that the problems of having such unregulated finance around the world, direct economies has led to this crisis. But instead, um, instead of learning those lessons, in fact, there was a doubling down and, and um, more power given to finance and the result was increasing inequality, effectively driving down the income and wages of poorer people and driving up the wealth and the protection of, of the most elite. So the redistributive justice concept is that we can't just change the current rules. We do need to look at where the wealth is around the world, the power and the resources, and redistribute that. Um, the economic justice is to talk about how do people, how do how does uh, the how do current economic rules get made, but also how do we value labour and revalue that so that it's a more more of a just um, valuation. Of course, we've got the environmental justice, and that's a commonality amongst them all. So that we are living in a time where we know that um, that our way of life is a threat to the continued existence of humanity and that climate change is an existential threat. So all of these talk about economic changes to economic and social rules that would become more sustainable, environmentally sustainable. Um, and the, the gender and social justice, I think is common particularly in these two, the feminist fossil fuel free future um, and development justice. And I think the Green New Deal has started to, to look into, you know, what could, how could these new frameworks be also emancipatory for women? And partly that's recognising care, that care has been a devalued part of our economy and any investment in public services, public health, public care and education redistributes the burden of care that is that rests on women but it also needs more fund, other fundamental shifts um, in terms of investing in things like um, in in services you know domestic violence services courts and so forth as well as new forms of democracy and where women would have a clearer uh, voice and that's the last transformative shift then is um, accountability. So talking about how we can 
none of this can, is possible unless we have accountability, genuine accountability of decision makers um, and also accountability to each other, having local forms of democracy. Um, so I think that these are some of the common demands. I don't think I'll have time to go through each one of them, but maybe if I, you know, if, if they're listed here, um, if there's any questions about why, why any of these are common demands across those four, we can come back to them. But I'll just briefly mention um, that but it's each of those models starts with the idea that we have to change what the purpose is of both governments and the economy. And increasingly under neoliberalism, the purpose of governments has been to create an environment for investors and to create security for investors and rules for investors. And that the, that is the model that um, the economy will work on, but not just the economy, that's how they shape other parts of what should be governance. Um, so it's to shift that away and to think that the purpose, you know, economies are there only to serve a broader purpose, which is public good, public health, public social care and harmony. Um, and all of those models require, in order to do that, a large investment in the public, in the commons, in things that we share and in things that can remedy inequality and disadvantage. And they are public health, public education, public transport, research that we need, you know, whether that be health research or other technological research, um, in energies, and that's, the, I think, the next point down in water and also in just basic public space and areas we can enjoy. Um, the decarbonisation to energy democracy is an idea that we would, we need to look clearly, we need to move away from carbon based energy, but at the same time, there are still many people who don't have access to energy or that it's unaffordable. So energy democracy is talking about how people could should be able to have a say in their energy and own it at the local level as well as at a, a more sort of regional national level and that it needs to be uh, renewable. Um, the restore industrial, the governments need to take back their capacity to have industrial policies, meaning that they need to have the capacity to decide we need this kind of industry. And this pandemic has shown that the failure to allow the market to decide where we produce things. And once supply chains shut down, then countries have none. So countries don't have any PPE, the personal protective equipment, because they stopped producing it. It was cheaper to outsource that somewhere else. Almost no product is now um, produced in one country. So you are inherently dependent on others, which isn't always a bad thing, but it does, the governments need to look at those things that have to be required for public goods and, and personal protective equipment would be one, but medicines is another. Um, India is in a better position than most, in, especially in terms of medicines, given that it does produce a large amount of the world's medicines. But many, many countries, of course, Africa, African countries are entirely dependent on India's production and China's production of medicines. So we need to look at how we can restore the right of governments to, to ensure they have um, production which has been taken away by the rules of global trade, global trade rules, which say governments cannot try and, and support a local industry. And for example, India was taken to the World Trade Organization because it tried to support, the government tried to support a local solar industry, which seems reasonable, I think, to most people to say, yes, if we're going to move away from climate disaster, we have to support those industries and, and perhaps create local solar production, meaning that India could produce its own solar panels and solar technologies, and instead it's been um, sued for that. So these are the types of rules that we need to restore or, or abolish um, and restore the, the sovereign right to be able to create local industry. Um, then we move through to agricultural restoring the types of agricultural practices that are more sustainable. I've mentioned eliminating trade rules, patents, medicines. I've, I've, I think that's critical. We can't let pharmaceutical companies profiteer. Looking at what living wages um, should be 
And then we need some global tax reforms, which I'll very briefly mention. Um, I think we they're one of the responses we often get is can governments afford these kind of demands? You know, these are unrealistic demands and governments can't afford them. Well, the one thing this pandemic has done is shown us that when governments really do want to, they can afford things. They can afford to shut down the economy if they wanted to, and they can afford large scale investments. In many countries, um, in my country, in Australia, the government is uh, actually funding people now to stay home and um, providing a job, uh, job seeker and job keeper payments. Um, and that's unheard, that would have been unheard of before this, but they can find the money and there's different ways to do that. Um, and this little graph just shows you that they, they do do that for the private sector. So whilst the, the uh, demand to privatise public services has often been because governments need the money, over 30 years of privatisation, the money that governments have received by selling off our public goods is less than the money that some governments spent on bailing out the large banks in the global financial crisis. So they found that money suddenly when it was needed to bail out banks. And yet in other times they've said they need that money and um, have sold off public services. Public services are often actually quite profitable for governments, not that they have to be, that's not the rationale. But this small amount of money that they've received is certainly no justification that they can find money when required. And even more clearly, there is money, but it's sitting in global tax havens. So there's something between 20 and $30 trillion sitting in tax havens around the world, which is clearly denying um, the public the, the funds that we need to invest. And if that money was taxed annually at 30%, at for example, we would clearly have enough money required to, for public services. But governments now are actually finding other ways. I mean, part of the way money has been um, generated is through understanding that we don't act, the governments are in control of determining how much money circulates in the economy. And in most of the time, they give that control away to banks, but they can, uh, they can generate their own public revenue through their own central banks when required. And they did that. And when this model of a Green New Deal um, is talked about. It's often referred back to times where um, the New Deal in the post-war era created, uh, oh, sorry, the, in the first post-First World War, uh, created large-scale jobs and um, through public investment and public infrastructure, or when the Marshall Plan, which is post-Second World War, uh, invested in, in countries that needed to be rebuilt. And that was not through private sector banks, that was through governments just uh, generating the, rev the, the, the funds they needed, but through their own capacity as a central bank to issue itself money. So it is possible. Um, and the last thing before I you know, stop and see if there's any comments or questions, I think is the, the central the central organising idea around all of these models, whether it be the Green New Deal, a new social contract, a feminist fossil fuel free future or development justice, is that the promises that were made uh, when the United Nations was set up, that were through demands of people that realised that wars, you know, that the wars were in the interests of a few, but also that were looking for new systems. Uh, the promise was of solidarity. And one of the central organising principles of the UN has been solidarity. But solidarity has very quickly been eradicated from even its own work, from the UN's own work. It's rarely talked about and um, it's really been sidelined as a, a principle of international law. But this moment, I think, gives us the opportunity to realise that the only way for survival for humanity is solidarity. And that's both because of the health threats that we face, as well as the climate threat that we face. Neither of those can be dealt with by one country. 
Uh, they're all global problems. They're all existential problems and they all have an answer, which is um, the solidarity and, and uh, the concept that we've been talking about, development justice. Thank you so much, Kate. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so friends, this is a great time. So please uh, either unmute yourself and feel free to speak with Kate, share comments, questions, clarification questions. She's here with us to help us dive deeper into these issues. It was absolutely an amazing presentation. Thank you so much, Kate, for these insights. Thanks. While uh, while web, please feel free to ask questions. You can unmute yourself or also use the chat box. So, yeah. So while we wait, Kate, uh, like the comment which you made early on that the pandemics reflect the societies we live in and the response reflect the society we want was so were, is really bang on spot. And there were so many things which were which may you know which appealed uh, to us. And one of the things probably you might have uh, read in the news is that the five people, the first five deaths in COVID was uh, in Bhopal were, were among people who were uh, affected by who were survivors of Bhopal gas tragedy. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like how uh, you, you, and also it was great that you put the focus on that preventive health is also part of health, uh, health security and we are, mm -hmm. and the kind of medical and healthcare system is only more about curative, but there's a whole huge pandemic, which is propelled by corporations, uh, which like, which we do not have to deal with, like the burden of health, for example. For, for instance, 70% are non-communicable disease-related deaths, heart disease, cancers, diabetes, and a lot of these is related directly to our lifestyles, and which is totally influenced by how corporations are marketing and profiting. So, um, so Bhopal gas tragedy is a disaster, but still, uh, like that is again that has come back where, where communities are still struggling for justice. So, um, mm. so my uh, before the you know, they ask questions that like, one will be like, how to advance uh, work on holding corporations to account, but also uh, to ensure that uh, corporations are not allowed to um, do things which are actually going to be counterproductive for large sections of society. Uh, so mm. can you please share, thanks. Yeah, um, I think, yeah, without a major shift, in the way that corporations can exercise their power, uh, you know, we won't, we will probably see as a result of this instead, even deeper, even deeper control by corporations. And as I said, we have to recognize that there's a movement for that. There's a movement that's, that's essentially trying to um, do away with governments and just have us have govern, govern. There's a concept that a few corporations came together at the, the World Economic Forum to talk about governance without governments. And that means uh, governance by self-governance by corporations. Um, and as you know, Bobby, because you've done a lot of work on, on tobacco, for example, that remains one of the only examples where the global community has been able to come together and look at the threat that corporations are to our health and try, regulate so that they have limited power, um, although they're gaining, I think, more power because now they, they work within the ILO, for example, giving funds, um, but that they had for some time limited power. And the same applies now that smokers are, you know, more at risk of COVID than non-smokers. Um, but we won't see a responsibility taken by the tobacco corporations. Um, so I think that model, of course, where we've seen in the past that, that the UN has prohibited the, the, the tobacco companies from, from influencing uh, public health policies, we need that more broadly. We cannot have these pharmaceutical corporations influencing uh, decisions about public health. Um, also, I mean, the, the move that there has been to have a global body to... to um, a binding treaty to regulate transnational corporations. I think this is a, an important move that some governments were actually supporting to say that it's time to regulate those corporations who are doing large damage um, both to 
health, public goods, but and also to the capacity of governments to do the jobs they're supposed to do. So we do need that. We, you know, so I think both we need the, the reduction in the rules, the rules that protect them, the trade rules, the national rules, as well as an increase in rules to hold them to account for accountability and um, to deliver justice for the violations that have occurred. I see a question here. Pe people yeah. tend to turn towards private healthcare due to tendencies of public sector. Do you think that public private partnerships could be a solution to this? Um, I mean, I, you know, part of what I tried to show you is how much money in the private sector it might seem efficient, but it's largely inefficient because the money is not going to public health. I mean, a small amount does. That, so what, what's seen as efficient uh, is, is from an economic perspective, how much money a, a, a private health company will say they're efficient if they can extract more profits from each uh, visit they have, for example. So they will measure their efficiency on the basis of how quickly they can deal with a health problem because that increases their shareholder value. And they're, re they're required to do that by law. They must maximise their shareholder value by law. So the idea that, that our public systems are not efficient is in their interests, and it's constantly said by them, by the World Bank, by others, that the public system is not efficient. But sometimes that efficiency means that the doctor is spending more time with you in a public, <laughs> you know, in a public hospital, and that's not seen as efficient, or that um, water is inefficient because, you know, it's they've chosen uh, less poorer communities, perhaps, or, or less dense communities to deliver the water, and they're using smaller amounts, and and that's how efficiency gets valued. Um, so I think efficiency is something that we should really question. The world has become more efficient because that's valued, that's measured in terms of how much money is made compared to wages. But none of that efficiency has gone to people. So, yeah, I think what we should be doing is looking at what the problems in the public health system are and putting money into them to address that. Um, and that's where the World Bank's money in India should go to. I don't think public-private partnerships are the answer. Um, of course, the, pub, the, the, the private sector might play a role in, in building hospitals or in, you know, but not in delivering public health. I think that's, that's purely a role of the state. Um, so I've got another question here. Why do you think the world is not progressing faster to adapt fossil-free fuels? why there isn't enough research and development by the government in renewable sources of energy. Uh, for example, just now we have moved to electric cars, but in India, it's still a distant mirage. What can we do to increase demand? I think that's a really good question because actually this is a problem that we've got very little public government money going into renewables. And that does leave the door open. Most renewables now are in the private sector and Partly that's because the governments have got larger investments in fossil fuels. So they're already invested in fossil fuels and it would be a huge, you know, they, they have to find the money to move away and they're the ones that are invested. But also it's because uh, corporations, of course, have not, you know, I've pressured them not to. Um, where, go where governments around the world have tried to regulate fossil fuels, they've been sued by corporations. So you know, even in Europe where there's been a move to try and shut down some fossil fuels or shut down nuclear because of its risks, some of those governments are sued by corporations for doing so. So part of it is the rules that um, have done that. Um, and part of it is, of course, the, the power of corporations, like even the, the oil companies who we obviously don't want to see something like um, electric cars and because there's not as, you know, there's very little money to be made in the, in the continuation of those cars. It's like you can sell a car, but then there's not a lot of money for corporations to be made after you buy a car. So it is partly that electric cars don't buy in quite as much or aren't, have, they haven't found a way to profit from them. 
after they sell them in the same way that you can profit from a, a, a um, fossil fuel dependent car. So that's a fundamental difference that has to be made. Um, okay, considering that one of the things you told us is fossil fuel free future, the problems with renewable sources are not only nuclear, it's maybe one of the feasible ones. What should the, to, what should the world do to, towards a new alternative to fossil based energy? Or due to the efficiency per unit used. Yeah, I mean this is a this is also because part of uh, the role of our global union is to re represent workers in energy. So we want to see how those workers cannot you know shouldn't just be discarded. Those workers that are working in coal, for example, shouldn't just you know no longer have a job. We need to look at what kind of transition there is. What energies can we use that will provide reliable sources of energy and good jobs? And there's not that many examples yet where we've seen that they do both. Um, in terms of the research and development, I mean, that's, that's part of the problem is governments haven't put enough into the research and development because they've left that to the private sector. Where, but increasingly there is it is clear that we can rely on more and more renewables for the um the, the main for, you know for, for most energy needs even though we've been told we can't it increasingly looks like we can but they but what what we haven't found yet is a good way to do that with good jobs and from, a, from the perspective of workers who might have jobs where they're unionised and, and they're a government employee in the fossil fuel, coal, you know, producing energy, it's very hard to give that job up with the promise that maybe they'll get a job in distributing solar or maybe in, in hydro or, you know, so we really need a coordinated shift and the private sector can't do that. Only a government can have a coordinated shift to other sources and it won't happen overnight. You've got to have it gradually done um, with you know, clear plans and that's not a planning about the transition of an entire energy source isn't something the private sector can do. Uh, to what degree does the infrastructure of a country impact their adaptability towards sustainable resources and how can the idea of sustainability be ingrained in the population as a whole? So, Okay, <laughs> good big questions here. Um, so infrastructure, I think, is part of this idea. I mean, the main, the main investments in other times I've talked about where there's been large shifts um, and the government has taken a large role in ensuring that there's full employment and a decent living standard has, been, has included large infrastructure development. Um, and... Some of that infrastructure has been the sorts of things I've talked about, public health systems, public energy sources, um, public uh, new public water or public universities. Some of it has also been creating new infrastructure that might not have been thought of before. And at the moment that could be like recognizing that uh, there's an interest in having large public internet access. Um, maybe large, uh, you know, maybe the government has a role in developing an equivalent to Google that is more in the public interests than, you know, for profit. So there could be other types of large public investment in infrastructure. I know that, you know, in, in Australia, uh, in the post-war era, we, there was huge infrastructure, a new energy system was built. My parents went to work in that new energy system when my, my father came to Australia and that gave thousands, hundreds of thousands of people jobs. Um, but there was also really interesting things like new public libraries that were built and new uh, along the, the, the beach, the beaches here in Australia. In my state, there's a lot of public baths, which are very beautiful, built around the 1920s to create jobs. So they just did that as something that people could enjoy, that they would have public baths there on the beach as, an, as also an employment strategy. And that's what we need, I think, is the ideas that the public can also participate in in this sense 
And that is partly an answer to the second part of that question, which is um, how can we change the public idea? I think we will see changes in public opinions because of this pandemic. And certainly in terms of public health, I think there'll be a lot of you know, people wanting to talk about why, how we need um, increased public health systems. But um, we will also need thought leaders out there. We need people talking about this. We need to share other uh, possibilities. We need to imagine differently. And that will take a lot of engagement, uh, social movements, um, and you know, some kind of effort with media. So I think there's quite a lot to be done. I mean, education is, is a very important part of that. Um, yeah, I think that I've answered, perhaps I've answered those questions. Right. That yeah. Thanks a lot, Kate. Yeah, so there are a few co two comments on the Facebook, so I'll just read them out. So one is about when you said about uh, valuing labor. So the comment is about that uh, nurses are uh, left behind. So that's true, probably in Indian context where, and the reference is that uh, the nurses are left behind, like on World Health Day, the theme was around nurses, but the focus was on doctors. So which is true, yeah. like, uh, you know, in India, nurses and midwifery, that labor is not really that valued, which it should be. And uh, also that most of these jobs are in con contracts. So again, doctors mm. are less on contract compared to the number of nurses and midwives who are in contract. Mm. So uh, before before I let you answer that, I would like to share that in Lucknow, you would be surprised that in COVID-19, you, you know, when the lockdown happened, the ambulance worker drivers, they went on a strike in several districts, not just Lucknow, in Uttar Pradesh mm. state, because they were, they did not had, they had not received wages since last three months. So because of COVID-19 pandemic, urgency perhaps the chief minister immediately sanctioned the wages but the point here is that why were they not paid for for the last three mm -hmm. months and this probably reflects the inequities uh, which uh, you so strongly pointed out to yeah please over mm -hmm. to you on nurses and advice yeah. and role value in labor mm. well i think it's obvious why nurses are valued less than others it's because they are mainly women um and that's historically been the case hasn't it that um that it's seen as part of women's natural job. And I have a big shout out if there's anybody on, our, on the Facebook from the Nurses Union, the United Nurses Association, which is PSI's affiliate, um, one of an incredibly impressive union in India who's been organizing nurses and had you know, really impressive results in some cases to go from abominable wages to slightly better wages, you know. Um, and it's been a learning experience for me as well to see how terribly nurses can be treated in some places. Right now, some nurses, of course, have been evicted from their homes because they're seen as a risk. Um, and, the, and the risks they're taking are very real. I mean, around the world, health workers are dying, um, risking their lives to do this, and yet, and nurses, are in contact with patients a lot more than doctors. So the risks are actually higher for those nurses um, who are on a day-to-day -day basis. And in India, it's also the community health workers. And this is another area we're trying to support unions to organise, is to um, have community health workers recognised as public health workers uh, who are, should be entitled to a living wage. Uh, we've been doing that in, in India, in Pakistan and in Nepal. And in Pakistan, it's, it's actually been successful that those women are now recognised as public sector workers who are entitled to a wage, not just to an honorarium. And um, we, this pandemic, I think, should push us all to recognise the huge risks those women, whether they be nurses in the health system, private or public, or whether they be community health workers, who at the moment are going door to door in many cases and have a responsibility that to check where people are and to give information. And in the future, we'll be part of delivering vaccines, which you know is the only way that eventually we'll get through this. So our lives are depending on those women who are, have been devalued. I mean, I think the way to deal with that is to unionize. In Australia, the largest union in the country is nurses. So they are the largest and potentially most powerful union in the country. Um, and they have decent wages and conditions as a, or mostly decent wages and conditions as a result. 
Um, uh, Thank you. So uh, thanks, Kate. Yeah. So friends, if there is any last minute question, please ask me. It's already an hour. So thank you so much, Kate, for your time. If there is any last minute questions, Kate, you are you're welcome to unmute yourself, speak, or send a quick chat. If there is any last minute question for for Kate, it has been an extremely stimulating and thought provoking session. I see any, one here. I've right, just received. Right, right. Okay. Unless somebody wanted to speak. But uh, the question was, how important are government and public policies going to be for achieving solidarity? And especially should the aim for equality for opportunity or equality of outcome um, an individualistic or group based ideology, which is which way to support? So, um, well, I mean, of course, I think that government policies are fundamental to achieving solidarity uh, because governments have to show solidarity to each other part of what I was suggesting about solidarity is global solidarity. Uh, the only way to do to address the climate crisis is through global solidarity, recognition that we have an obligation to each other across countries, uh, but also internal solidarity. But as a unionist, I think that solidarity also means we have to have the capacity to show our solidarity and bring that together and defend each other, whether we be impacted or not, I should be able to go on strike because I think the nurses are not being treated properly. We, we want to show our solidarity, which shouldn't just be in holding up a light for nurses, but it should be through being able to take collective action. And I should say, you, you mentioned actually, Bobby, on the World Health Day, but World Nurses Day is coming up in May. Um, and that should be the, I think we should really sh think uh, collectively about how to show nurses that they're properly valued then, which is really through public investments in their, you know, both in their wages and the public health system, that would be the important way to show solidarity. But in terms of the question of individual quality of opportunity or quality of outcome, I think, you know, sometimes the idea of equality, um, individual equalities has been um, not that, not always helpful because even within the feminist movement, the idea that you know what we want is the same number of women on boards, for example, or um, the, these, this kind of individualized equality isn't really looking at the systemic issues that people face. And until we, I think that until we can actually see that the system has changed, and then we will see the equality of outcomes, um, we'll you know we won't have real equality, and that includes equality across class. So we can't just expect to see, you know, demand that there are women on boards or the same amount of women even in, in parliament when those people are coming from fairly elite backgrounds. Um, so I think we need to really think through the idea of solidarity to look at uh, how equality has been shaped by other systems, not individual, not individual merit or in, even individual ideas of discrimination because no one is necessarily discriminating against somebody by expecting a woman at home to do all the care. That's been a social expectation, not an individual one. And that's why we have to shift the, the broader structural problems, um, not just those on an individual basis. Yeah, so I hope that answered those questions, all very good questions that have come through that probably all could have had a whole session dedicated to them. Absolutely. Thank you again. Thanks a lot, Kate. We are very, very grateful on behalf of Indian Institute of Management Indoor and CLS. We're extremely grateful again for this uh, very inspiring, very thought-provoking uh, session with you. We, are really we have, were looking forward to this too so much. Uh, and uh, friends, you will listening to Kate Lapin, especially those who are listening on podcast. Uh, she is the regional court, regional secretary, sorry, for Public Services International in the Asia Pacific. And uh, we we welcome you on the next session of SDG Talks with the uh, Tete Nera Loron. She's a, a strong voice on climate justice. And uh, thanks a lot, Kate, for uh, mention, for focusing on climate justice also and in relation to development justice. And we are going to dive deeper into that on next Monday. Uh, thank you so much, Kate. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bobby. Bye-bye.